Hello, and welcome to the University of Utah Guest Writers Series. I'm Alan Borst, the administrator of the Creative Writing Program here at the U. Before we begin our event with Mark Wunderlich, we want to acknowledge that this land upon which the university is located and which is named for the Ute tribe is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Let me now introduce Jackie Baldarama, who will tell you more about today's Hey everyone, welcome to the Guest Writers Series. I'm Jackie Balderama, the Administrative Fellow, helping to coordinate this series with Creative Writing Administrator Alan Borst. Today we are happy to be joined by Mark Wunderlich. For tonight's program, we'll begin with an introduction by Maddie Lane Glasgow, after which Mark Wunderlich will read. He will then engage in a conversation moderated by University of Utah Professor Paisley Rectal. We'll conclude with a Q&A from some select graduate students and then open it up to everyone. Please note that the Q&A function has been en enabled at the bottom of your screen uh, and feel welcome to share any questions for Mark there. Also know that this event is being recorded and will be made available on the U of U English YouTube channel. We encourage you to purchase books by the guest writer at your local bookstore a link to purchase God of Nothingness at King's English Bookstore here in Salt Lake City will be posted in the chat momentarily. The Guest Writer Series was made possible through the University of Utah's English Department and received funding from the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks uh, Program and Utah Humanities. Utah Humanities empowers groups and individuals to improve their communities through active engagement in the humanities. This series is also supported in part by Utah Arts and Museums, with funding from the State of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. I'd like to invite Maddie Lane Glasgow to turn on his camera and mic as he introduces Mark Wunderlich. Mark Wunderlich's fourth collection, The God of Nothingness, begins with an exploration of the poet's surname in a poem that opens to myriad definitions and details in rendering the self. A name like the body is an inheritance. And here Wonderlick not only tells of his family's history, their journey up the Mississippi and settling in Wisconsin, but of the eccentricities of the man himself, pancakes for supper, his preference for cats, a gnome tattoo, and his inclination on occasion to wear peculiar garments to a party. I suppose peculiar lies in the eye of the beholder because Mark Wonderlick is chic AF. He holds the poetic line and his coiffure to the highest of standards. Each syllable and strand is styled impeccably, precisely where the poet desires. Many of us will only ever aspire to such respectability, such sleek presentation. I challenge our audience members to scour the internet for a poem with a word out of place or a single photograph in which a hair is blown askew. Trust me, you will not find it. I have done the research. But I digress, for here the emperor is, in fact, more than his clothes. While the god of nothingness opens and closes with candid interrogations of the self, of how we define ourselves and what we choose to allow to define us, the book also concerns itself with devastating absences and loss of a mentor and friend, of a lover, of family, of a cherished pet. There's even room for an encounter with Jeffrey Dahmer and a rather beautifully nuanced fisting scene, though not in the same poem, thankfully for the safety of our visitor tonight. All of this is just to say there's something for everyone here. And are we surprised? We are not. Wonderlich's first collection, The Anchorage, received the Lambda Literary Award. He is also the author of Voluntary Servitude and The Earth Avails, which received the Rilke Prize from the University of North Texas and was a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Award. Wonderlich is the recipient of a Wallace Stegner Fellowship from Stanford University, two fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, as well as fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and the Amy Lowell Trust. 
He is also the recipient of Writers at Work Award, the Jack Kerouac Prize, and the Missouri Review's Editor's Prize. So, you know, he's doing well. Wonderlich is the director of the Bennington Writers Seminars Graduate Writing Program, and as many of the graduate students in this program can attest, is truly a kind and generous reader of poems by students and strangers alike. Mark brings incisive rigor and playful joy to his conversations with emerging writers who find in his pedagogy the same thing we find in his poems, inspiration. It's my pleasure to introduce the singular Mark Wonderlich. Maddie, thank you so much. That is, the, that is probably the best introduction I think I've, I've ever had. <laughs> that's, that's so marvelous. Um, thank you for your generosity there. And um, that's a, a really a, a wonderful way to, to start this off. I feel so welcomed and, you know, I, I got my hair ready just for you. So there. Um, I also want to thank Jackie Valderrama and uh, Alan Borst, who, with whom I've been corresponding in preparation for this visit, and of course to Paisley Rechtal, who is um, a poet I admire and a friend, and it's great to be uh, spending some time with all of you. I'm going to um, begin with something that's ill-advised, uh, but I'm doing it anyway, um, which is to read a very new poem. Um, part of giving a lot of readings, I find myself reading the same poems over and over again and um, in a short period of time. I'm teaching this class right now. It's sort of a short class. It's generative. And I asked all of the students in the class to commit to writing every day for 21 days. Um, and so I decided to do it along with them. And here's the thing about that, of course, it works if you make a commitment like that. So I'm gonna read this new poem and begin, and then I'm going to turn to the book. For My Colonial Dead. In November, we would go into the frozen forest leaves stripped, only a few birds ticking in the bare trees, fields shorn, corn trash, a dull gold. Sometimes snow would fall, and I can recall the exact sound of its muffling, quieting, whiteness crackling down. Of our hunting gang, only two of us are alive, grandparents long dead, father and nephew dead, their bones all on the ridge top with the others. The town is shabbier now, middle classes disappeared, leaving the angry, the ancient, and the slow. My brother is returning home to a place he reviled, having run out his luck in the West. His plan is to move into the garage on the old homestead, which of course is no plan at all. I sometimes hear the call to return, come back to the shady valley with its reliable breeze, the crumbling brindle bluffs, brandy old fashioned made with seven up waiting on the sticky bar of the golden frog, recognition registering with those I meet when they greet my father looking back from inside my aging face. That place don't fade, the one that made me. Bone isotopes belie the soil's iron and chalk. My talk inflected, sorry sounds like sore. What's more is that I want to go but won't. I'll stay here 2,000 miles away amidst an older Eastern decay. It turns out I have some local dead here as well fifth great-grandfather Christian Serfoss, colonial kraut from the Palatine, who died in some wintertime foolishness crossing the frozen Mohawk. His two boys watched him and his horses drown in that not very impressive water course. One of those boys made it to Iowa and disappeared, but not before he reproduced, becoming fourth great-grandfather to yours truly, and so on. My remaining colonial dead lie in the dirt near Palatine Bridge, their names effaced from marble by acid rain. I wish I didn't care about them, but I do. It matters to have this ghost clan near, this family 
I never knew. So now I'm going to turn to God of Nothingness. And in his introduction, Maddie uh, mentioned this poem uh, that refers to Jeffrey Dahmer. And I thought I would read that one. And it is called My Night with Jeffrey Dahmer. My night with Jeffrey Dahmer, like any night spent out in a bar, this one doused in the pink and blue neon 1989 for mica and brushed metal and the spin of sound in the club, while downstairs in a darker bar where the older men enjoyed each other's company and where I had gone to cool off. A man stood next to me and knocked my beer to the floor. So sorry, he was very sorry, hand on my arm as I bent to pick up the bottle. One hand on my arm, the other signaling to the bartender, holding up a finger, then pointing to the empty I proffered, put on the wooden counter, bottle which the keep swept away, replaced a cold green glass already sweating a bit, beating in the heat of the basement. He was a stranger, older than I was by a decade or more, blonde and mustached, big glasses, some farmer's son, a bit out of date, stuck as he was in the country, a man driven into the capital to spend a night among others of his kind, away from his mother's kitchen, the chilled hum of the bulk tank and the cows whose needs were at the center of a life spent in their service. But no, he was from Milwaukee, he said, though to me his words were unimportant. So sorry, let me, I'll get you a new one. Let me buy you one. And so he took out his wallet and handed over his dollars. And I suppose I looked to see if he left a tip, since I always look for this, having done already the work of service in which you depend on the manners and guilt and sense of custom of those you attend, their generosity, their goodness, their notion of what is normal and right, what to offer to others in exchange for their help, their attentiveness here. Let me buy you a beer. So sorry for my clumsiness. Let me put this hand on your arm. Do you live here? Are you at the university? Do you like the music? Did I tell you my name? His questions, the questions of any curious man talking to a farmer's son in a bar in Madison, Wisconsin, asking my name, which I withheld, my name, which I kept lodged between my teeth, under my tongue, in the pocket of my clavicle, and the scar on my eyebrow, in my belly, in the sack of my scrotum, in my head, my hand, my arm, which he touched lightly, my mouth, my teeth, my tongue, which began to move, unlock, give up its wariness, give in to say, my name is Mark, what's yours? I thought I would read, um, there's a, um, uh, Maddie also referred to um, some poems um, that I thought I would read, a series of prose poems. Um, and they are, the series is called Five Cold Stories. And they all take place in areas near the Arctic Circle. For a time, um, I traveled north during the winter to go to some of the coldest places um, where I could spend time. And each of these poems begins with a little um, epigraph from a, a book kind of about the um, about that place. Um, this one is called uh, maybe I'll read another one. I'll go ahead and read the first one. This one is called Reykjavik, Iceland. Now that you now you must have no more kisses, she said, or I should kiss you to death from The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. In Iceland, I put my hand inside a man. It was a sexual act. He lived in a black tower overlooking the sea. 
Snow crowned the mountains and out his window, the aurora pulled its ragged curtain of light across the night sky. It is interesting to feel the bones move inside a man, interesting to his pulse. I cannot say I was sexually stimulated, rather the atmosphere was stimulating. You must understand I was being generous. I followed his instructions carefully and with something resembling love. I wore a latex glove and nothing else. His bedroom was spare and elegant in the Nordic fashion, and he kept the chains of his sling tightened with tape so the ringing of the links would remain unobtrusive. In drawers with pads to prevent slippage, his tools were arranged as precious objects. Sweet were his lips and sweet the taste of night, skin white and warm flushed pink at the neck. How had I come to this bony island heated by molten rock, hand in a man above my wrist? I imagine myself reading alone or with a cat bald on my lap, little body and brain familiar to the fingers. Later, we stood on the street as morning broke against the shore, having reassembled our faces. He touched my coat. When Petr spoke, he stammered, and I leaned closer so as to better attend his mouth. I thought I would read another prose poem. I can find it here. Once Forgotten. The old woman kept the tulip bulbs in the basement to keep them from the muskrats, overwintered the geraniums in a barrel. She fed the water snake who lived in the boathouse, flicking little stars of meat, which he rose up to catch, his body black as the night's shadow. When we played down in the storm sewers and didn't come home, she walked through town and shouted into the grates, Tweety, are you down there? She didn't care. When she cleaned a carp, she kept the lucky stone from inside its head as a bingo chip, chopped the carp into chum. I bought her Chesterfields whenever she asked, and she smoked them in a blue fog in the kitchen, frying pan in the oven to keep the flavored grease. When she taught us to shoot, she took us to the dump so we could practice on unlucky rats. She taught us to clean sunfish and crappies and pike. When we needed a puppet, she sewed us a puppet. When we were sick, she fed us peppermint schnapps. The old woman kept a porcelain, broken porcelain doll and a thick severed braid in the cedar chest at the foot of her twin bed, pure sentimentia. Shit or get off the pot, she'd say as we played penny ante with ourselves. Her house by the river shook from the trains. The barge lights stroked the dark bedroom in the night. She made turkeys with pine cones and pipe cleaners glued sequins onto styrofoam balls. Once she made kolaches, but never again. The pork roast was always smothered in kraut. And when she forgot, she forgot all of it, forgetting to eat, forgetting to dress, forgetting even where she was, waking up wet and cold on the floor. Me, she forgot me too. Wind blew through the pines out on the sand prairie, and that's what she became. She forgot me, and I was forgettable. Once forgotten, I could walk away and be free. Um, I'm broadcasting to you live from within my house here in Catskill, New York, which is allegedly haunted. This poem is about it, and it's just called Haunted House. I moved into the haunted house and gutted it to the bones. I wasn't alone then and worked there in a team. We evicted squirrels from their vast nutshell nest filled dumpsters with 50 years of trash. I found three lit and ornamented trees in a pile of brush, uncovered secret drawings in a drawer. We tore up a floor to uncover a floor, sanded tulip poplar to a sheen. 
I let the others unhouse the rat snake muscled around the boiler pipes downstairs. They took it in a pail to Corlair's Creek where it braided angrily away. I too slithered in the muddy crawl space, headlamp sputtering with sweat. When the house began to wake, the strangers began to arrive, driving their cars up our long drive to have a proper snoop. Uninvited, they told of Dutch Mary rocking in her scarf, dead slaves buried in a hollow up the hill, the wellhead by the Indian trail where carriages stopped to let their long dead horses have a drink. If you think this scared me, you'd be wrong. I know a story meant to frighten when I hear one. Now I live here alone with the spirits I cannot see. I spend my days inside these rubble stone walls, cooking small meals and stoking logs into a smoking stove, while around me history stills to pictures in a frame, the same clouded view for old Dutch Mary waiting at the window once again. Shanty. No one remembers what became of the people in the house now swaybacked in the marsh. Not the mice whispering and tunneled in the couch. Not the snapping turtle armored on a log, retracting his hard beak into wrinkled folds like foreskin. Not my mother who visited the shanty once as a nurse, noting the packed dirt floor the walls pasted up in newsprint. They burnt waste oil in a barrel stove they got free from a garage, dipped their water from a spring, now greened with cress. Artist Kyle Holtz knew something of the wife, but couldn't think, what was she called to home? When I was small, I heard roosters crowing from their yard and think I rode a school bus with the girl, but now I couldn't say for sure. Bill went, taught me to trap muskrats in that swamp, staking a conibear in the muddy muskrat runs with brush. I pulled their plush furred bodies from the ice, sold them for cash money to the fur man in the spring. How long will I keep telling stories just like this? Dirt floors and trap lines and a shack abandoned in a swamp. The vividness of that world is fading like my father's addled mind. Poverty is not poetry, this I know, but these pictures are what's left of childhood and now all my male relatives are gone, though lost and half remembering my father living on. So that poem uh, was written prior to my father's death. And this one came afterwards. And this will be the last poem I read. First Chill. This year I did not love the first snow, took no joy from the clean whiteness masking the contours of my yard. The last leaves stripped from the weeping beach to reveal its looping undercarriage, the ground hardened underfoot as the world froze in late November. I've secretly admired the first hard frost killing the garden, putting an end to its many failures, the beetles and rusts finally put to death and which are hard not to see as moral judgments on my insufficient diligence. This year I put on the woolens, banked the stove with oak and elm, watched the snow feather down on the spruce, the grass still green under white. And I felt an uncommon dread for the inward turn that usually marks these days that end in early nights at home with their fi firelit contemplations and the privacy of the lamp encircling the pages of an open book. I wanted more, 
not of summer, with its swampy air and the nighttime amphibian whir, but of autumn, with its metallic skies swept with clouds, of the promise of something about to end, but not yet taken away. Above the Catskills, the peaks are veiled in a cloud of snow. This is where I think my dead have gone, my father and Lucy and John, the dead being impervious to cold, having left their bodies with us to cherish, but also to bury and to burn. I imagine them as they wander the high peaks, rippling like figures underwater, like figures one dreams and forgets, a shape drawn and erased, so only the pencil's impress remains. Now that they are frozen, I know they are truly dead. Let me let them go, I pray to the god of nothingness who rules those icy bluestone peaks, who hides the world of the living underneath his coat of snow. He has taken them from me, and now I will them coldly to go. Thanks very much. Hi. <laughs> that hey, was wonderful. hey, good to see you. Um, to see you I'm going to try and angle this so that I might have to move it. Well, oh well. Um, I want to remind everyone to please buy this book. There is a link up in the chat. So um, please, please do that. You will not regret this purchase. So before we start talking a little bit about your book, um, one of the things that really struck me also that I think you did really beautifully in the reading to sort of encapsulate some of the themes, but also the tone of the book. I was thinking the question of fear um, and severity kind of comes up a lot when I read this. This is a very severe collection and that sounds more imposing than I mean, but there's a real, not only a restraint, but um, an unflinching quality to the poems as they consider mortality. Um, these are poems that sort of involve a kind of nostalgia, but certainly do not delve into any of the sort of nostalgic sentimentality. It's absolutely elegiac, but very severe in its elegiac thing. And there's also um, something of the Flannery O'Connor, the Gothic Midwest. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the ways in which fairy tales, the supernatural, uh, everything is, is structured in a very real world, but it also feels as if that real world could tilt at any moment into something very dangerous, very surreal, very supernatural, that, that they were always like very close to the edge. So one of the things that actually really um, struck me about the collection was it would be hard to work in a mode like that over the course of a book consciously. So I'm wondering how you structured this, how, when did you understand the themes of the book, how it was going to be put together. Well, I had I had written, um, I, I guess I'd written some of the poems that I felt feel are kind of outliers in this collection a little bit, and then I had a couple of periods where, um, you know, during which I they they were intensely um, generative, and I I found. You know, in 2018, I wrote I wrote most of the book, I think, in 2018, but I had written a couple of the longer poems and things at other times. But th during that year, uh, you know, I'd had this year where eight people in my life died, you know, it, like starting early with like some older relatives and, you know, they were old and but like three of them died in one week. So that was kind of intense. And then, you know, then my both of my mentors died in a year. Lucy Brock Broido and Sandy McClatchy were both these very important figures for me. And then a student of mine who was, um, she was an adult, you know, uh, uh, we were about the same age. She'd been my student at Columbia and we were starting a friendship after she'd been my student. And she died suddenly of an aneurysm. And then, um, and then my friend John committed suicide. And then finally, um, days before my 50th birthday, my father died. And it was also the year that I was charged with um, um, selling the family farm. So it was this year of all of these losses, right? And I had this, this sense of needing to kind of get that down. 
Um, this sense of needing to, if I didn't write about it now, I thought I'll never write about these things. They'll just sort of fade away. They'll become too distant. I'll forget the details. And it was also helpful to me to try and it gave me something to do with all of that, with all those things I was losing. And it made it, made it, you know, um, in ways understandable. You know, it made these things kind of, comp I, I could comprehend these things better in ways if I was sort of writing about them. And so I did. Um, in terms of that, you know, it's, it's funny, the, the people talking about how folkloric the book is and the uses of the supernatural, things like that. And I, I, it's so funny because I think like, this is just where I was from, you know? I mean, it's like, this is just like life before the internet, you know, like this is <laughs> like, we had to kids. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's like we trap muskrats, you know? <laughs> I mean, that was like, uh, that's what we did for fun. Um, it was, uh, you know, there was, uh, there is this sense of, you know, when I'm writing about my very 20th century childhood in the 70s and 80s, I sometimes feel as though I've had like a 19th century childhood. And that. That. that does feel a bit Paul Bunyan y at a moment. <laughs> like, that's amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, but I, I, it's also like life in rural America. It's this, you know, this is, I mean, you know, growing up in this farm and, you know, really there were these neighbors who, you know, I grew up amidst rural poverty as well. You know, this is, this was these, it, it was, um, the 19th century lasted a, a really long time. <laughs> You know, and there were, it was, it, you could glimpse it, you could see into, it's like the neighbor's farm where they still farmed with horses. I remember like looking into this place and being like, I'm looking into the, I'm seeing 50 years ago now when I'm looking at this, things had not changed there. Um, and I, but it's also going away, you know, all of that has gone away. And so, you know, um, part of writing this book has been to, I am looking, I am being retrospective. I am looking backward. I'm trying to not, you know, I'm not the least bit sentimental about that place, which is still a place, you know? Um, and it was also a difficult place for me in a lot of ways, but my feelings about it are mixed. And I think like good poetry is made of mixed feelings. So that was my attempt, is to sort of convey that about these, these places. One more question before we start going to the graduate students, because I know they're going to have a lot of questions too, or maybe two questions. But I was really struck also going along with the folkloric question. I was struck by the ways in which uh, literal monsters um, appear in the collection, but the idea of a kind of monstrosity. The, mm. um, you know, the, there's a, a self, you know, and the narrative self occasionally comes up against his idea of his own monstrousness. But then there's literally a, a poem in which a, a narrator, you know, becomes, watches his sibling become a man, at, you know, this beast that turns into a man. And then, of course, the Jeffrey Dahmer poem. And I'm wondering again about how um, conscious or unconscious that was, is the, the, the use of a kind of um, delving into a kind of idea of monstrosity as you were working in the poems? Well, I would say it was totally, I was totally not conscious of it as I was writing about it. You know, we have these, these obsessions, these things that we gravitate toward and that we exercise and that we explore. And we're not, a, we're not all that aware of them. You know, I mean, the, the sort of cryptozoological poem that you talk about, The Beast of Bray Road, it was, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was, um, thinking about, um, you know, my boyfriend was making these paintings of sort of werewolves, like he was kept drawing like <laughs> werewolf hands and things and doing these. And so I was, you know, he was taught, he's like, hey, do you know that there's these stories in Wisconsin? Do you, where's Elkhorn, Wisconsin? And I was like, you mean where the Beast of Bray Road is? Like, you know, and it's this town in Wisconsin where in the 1930s, this Mon you know, this monster was seen multiple times and has continued to be seen on this road. This wolf-like creature stands up on his hind legs and walks across the road. And so people keep seeing it. So I just started thinking about, you know, I wanted to, to write about that. The encounter with Dahmer was one of those things which, you know, happened. And um, 
and it was a it was one of those kind of you know I, of course it only it only had meaning well after the event and my memory of it was so slim like it, like it's barely a memory i was like that guy you know when he sort of came on the news we we're like huh you know i remember him <laughs> you know i mean it was one of those it was one of those moments and that poem is really about trying to take a moment that meant nothing and lasted, literally lasted three minutes, five, four minutes, you know, something like, I don't even think it was that long. And then it was over, but to try and sort of expand that into, into something bigger, uh, now knowing what, what it was, what kind of a brush, you know, a brush with whatever it, it happened to be. In terms of the monstrous, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, but, you know, I think, um, I, I don't know. I think, um, I certainly think about hauntedness. If I think about monstrousness, I think queerness is also about like being a monster. You know, I, I think it's, I think it's about um, understanding that you're something else than everyone around you and you're kind of you know i mean growing up in a, in a small town sort of looking around where i did not know a single no of a single queer person like not there was not one identifiable person mm. um until i achieved second sight right which is when you're like <laughs> oh i see i know who you you know and it's like it's great kind of, uncle lars oh yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. like and if craigslist had existed then i would we would have known who they all were but it was like nothing radio silence like nothing you know yeah. you didn't know anyone and you felt like an alien you know you feel like this like like you're you're you know that that's part of what that I think maybe what that experience is but I don't know I hadn't really thought about much about the monstrous yet I'll have to think about that well before I turn it over to the um graduate students one of the things that I liked about the monstrous is it worked so well I think with the theme of the god of nothingness because I think that what comes up over and over in those poems is this sense that we are just on a nice edge between you know we we think that life has meaning and to a certain extent it, it does but you know, you go a little bit further. In fact, it doesn't have meaning that that you death is death and it does not have any of these kinds of redeeming things in the end. And then that that kind of knowledge is weirdly monstrous too. It's just sort of horrifying to come up against in a way that um, that open. And I think that's one of the things that's so, I mean, I don't know, I'm a dark person, but I'm like, I, I recognize that and I appreciate that. I appreciate the severity of that vision at the same time. I feel so much going towards it. but. I'm going to stop because uh, we got all these people queued up. So Paula and then Tyler. Um, Paula, do you want to ask a question? I will mute myself. Hi, thank you uh, so much for that beautiful reading and um, and yeah, for your, your beautiful work. Uh, I'm just going to read this question straight through. <laughs> um, God of nothingness is stark with loss and death and it is just as sharply alive. So a poem like Free Love Discarnate, where you get this funeral strata of a lifetime, layers piled over the dying, is immediately followed by a poem like Proposition that thrums with life and one marvels along with the poet to feel the sun on their skin. Or a poem like Midsummer, where I read it and feel grateful and in awe of the treasure of one's blood. So as someone who has felt unable and in fact haven't written, uh, hasn't written a, a, a poetry for almost the entire year of this pandemic, I want to ask what was your experience and process composing these poems and writing through so much grief and heartbreak? I'm, I'm thinking here of the poem on the autobiographical impulse, specifically the section on victimhood in which you write, you know nothing of the words I used to empty myself of myself and then follow with an accounting of life in the present that's both exuberant and violent, and then end with the God burns off and is already forgotten, except by the lines on this page. How do you relate language or making things out of language to mourning and death? Wow, thanks Paula, that's an amazing question. 
um, and um, a really, you know, really, um, um, I'm I'm flattered by the reading that you that you've made of that of that poem of those poems. I guess what I would say is, um, you know, one of one of the things. I mean, part of what it is to figure out how to be alive is to figure out how to live with loss. You know, and it's it's this thing happens. You know, at the middle of one's life, if one is you know living a living that long is that you, you know, people you know start to die and not just the old people, but, you know, uh, sometimes friends and peers and, you know, um, parents, um, other people, people who are important to you. And the struggle then is to figure out, you know, how do you, how does one learn how to love and celebrate one's life, you know, to live a full life while experience loss, while experiencing you know, terrible losses, because that's the only option, you know, it's the only option is to figure that out. Um, you know, I, I, I write those poems as, for me, poems are not about ways of making a declaration or saying something that I already know. For me, they are places in which I, I, I pursue what I don't know. And that the poem is the is the actual, um, you know, the poem is the is the um, is the mark that's left, um, showing the trajectory of that thinking of that exploration. You know, um, making art about things. Um, I I want experience to mean something. You know, I want the lived life to have meaning, and for me. I achieve that by making art about it. And, um, and so, you know, that helps me, um, that, that sort of helps me kind of make that make sense. So I don't know if that, if that got to your question, do you want, if you, if you want to do a follow-up or did that answer it, Paula? That answered, I, I mean, I feel, I feel like my question was answered by the experience of reading this book, but I also was just sort of marveling at, um, just how how devastating, but at the same time life affirming um, the experience of reading this book was. So thank you. Well, thanks for the question. Hi, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for your reading tonight. Uh, thank you. It's it's a it's a pleasure. Uh, you've spoken and written about your close relationship with Lucy Brock Broido. Uh, yours was a relationship, it seems, that began as so many of our relationships with poets necessarily do through the, the work itself, uh, before your relationship moved into the classroom and then transcended that classroom and now of necessity returns to the work. Um, how has your relationship with Lucy and with her work specifically developed and changed and deepened over the last three years. Uh, are there any poems of hers that have revealed themselves to you in strange or unexpected ways? And are there any poem of your, uh, poems of yours, uh, older or newer, that uh, evince your ongoing and unfinished relationship with Lucy and her work? Well, um, thank you for that, for that question, Tyler. And um, you know, Lucy was, um, you're right, I first encountered her when I read her first book. Um, and I read her first book when I was, um, uh, was thinking about which, you know, was, was thinking about graduate schools. And rather than sort of read the, um, you know, I, I, I read the faculty members who taught in those places, but I was also interested in reading graduates of those programs to see if, you know, what, what was there. And the thing about Columbia University, where I ended up going and where Lucy had gone, was that there's a, there are so many books that had come out of that place. There was a lot to choose from. And I remember reading these two um, books, reading uh, Lucy's first book, A Hunger, and reading Marie Howe's first book called The Good Thief. And I was blown away by both of them. And I still think that these are two magnificent books. You know, I think that they're really um, good first books of poetry. And, and I thought, I want to learn how to write like that. So that's what I want to want to do. Um, so then, you know, she, I did go to Columbia. She was hired there kind of miraculously. And then I just, you know, stayed with her that whole time. 
we then became friends and, you know, we'd spend time together and, um, you know, over the years then we developed a, you know, a, a, a friendship. And, um, you know, I really, when I found out she was dying and um, um, I really poured myself back into her work. I, I remember reading all of her books, you know, reading the four books and spending a lot of time with them during that period. And it felt like her voice was so alive in them once again. And, um, and I think that last book of hers, I think her final book is, is I just think it's kind of a masterpiece. I, I think that the poems, you know, so much of her work had, so much of her life and her work had been about maintaining a kind of artifice. And it was, you know, it was from everything to, from her clothes to her home to, you know, everything that was, was kind of around her. Um, but, but it was, it took so much to maintain all of that. It took so much to kind of maintain this incredible artifice that she had, but she did it because she thought that that fed her poetry, that it was through this exterior world that the interior world was brought forward. And, um, and I think um, as she aged, um, I think that, that she began to ask these really hard questions about whether it was worth it and whether the life devoted to art, whether having given up so much, sacrificed so much, um, and exchanged it for all of these other things, I think she started to see the cracks that were developing in that. And it, it was, it, and that's what the book is actually, that final book is actually about. It's about this acknowledgement of questioning whether or not art was enough. And, um, and it's heartbreaking in some ways to read those poems now. Um, but I, you know, um, I recommend that everyone read, read all of her books. And she was also an amazing teacher, absolutely sort of life-changing teacher. And I'll, I, I, I will always take that forward into the world and with everyone I teach and talk to because it really shaped my aesthetic and how I think about poems. Did that answer your question, Tyler? Uh, most certainly did. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So, oh, Maddie. Yeah, you have a question? I'll be really quick and then I promise. No, take I'll your time. time. <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, it was really interesting hearing you talk about artifice um, in terms of Lucy's work, because I think, especially in like the opening poem, Wonderlick, um, and then on the autobiographical impulse, it seems like you're kind of directly interrogating the self um, and in some ways like stripping away the artifice of the poem with the questions and even in some of the other poems in the collection, the speaker kind of revises or corrects himself. So I was wondering if you might just be able to, similar to maybe what we talked about earlier, but how you go about kind of rendering the self, but also kind of show us even the, the process of the poet and the mind of the poet in those poems. Um, and also I just want to say thank you for the queerness as being a monster because like queerness in the bestial is like fascinating to me. So that was great. Well, um, you know, we had, we had had this conversation a little bit earlier, Maddie, too, where we were talking about the, the poem on, on the autobiographical impulse and the sort of um, rendering of selfhood. And, um, you know, maybe just to repeat a little bit of what, of what we had talked about there, it, you know, we, we, um, I was, that poem is one that really does ask questions about the nature of identity and what, what, you know, what it's made of. And I, I wanted to ask questions about, you know, how we were, you know, is, is our identity, is it made up of what we have inherited? Is it, is it what we do and say? Is it our actions in the world? Is it how others see us? Is it about what others have done to us? You know, and those are the, those were some of the questions that I had. I don't know that I have answers, you know, to those things, right? And to um, also kind of contemplating, there's a section there, of course, thinking about victimhood, about being, being a victim of something. That is about having someone do something to you. And so that became a thing that I wanted to explore and ask. 
And the way of doing that for me in that poem was to, you know, come up with um, different ways of illustrating those problems, right? Different, different kind of narratives for exploring these various problems of identity, whether it be, you know, this is the story of what I have about who my ancestors were. This is a story about something that I did. This is a story about something that was done to me. And so each of these pieces was a way of me to kind of talking about and thinking through some of those to see if collectively we could arrive at some sort of conclusions about it. I don't know what that is. That's also a poem that talks about, you know, um, suicidality. It talks about, you know, the desire to end one's own life. Um, and so that's, you know, it explores this idea of like the worst things that have ever happened to us, the sort of worst states we've been in. I hope that that, I, you know, on the other end, I emerge out the other side of that poem eventually in the rest of the book. And, you know, I want to make it clear that, of course, I did. But I, I've always, you know, maintained that for me, you know, um, I, I want to write poems that have emotional content. I want poems in which I risk a great deal, that, that feel like the stakes of that poem have been raised significantly. And, you know, when one is sort of plying the one's autobiography, um, you can keep raising the stakes a little bit and exploring it. I, I took real, real um, uh, courage from, you know, reading Frank Bedard, for instance, the poet who is, has really kind of plumbed the depths. And um, so, you know, I feel like I'm straying a little far from your question, Maddie. Maybe do you want to rein me in or follow up? What would you like to do? No, that, that was beautiful. And we'll let someone else get to inquire now. Thank you for your time tonight. Sure, thanks for the question. Okay, so we have um, three questions that have come through. Two are kind of similar, so I'm gonna put them together. Uh, one is about talking about the relationship of sound and meaning in your work. And somebody else said, um, many of the poems in God of Nothingness are written in couplets. What do you find most attractive about the two line stanza? So, and a lot of those couplets also have rhymes too. So if you could talk about the couplets and rhyming and there's my husband right on cue. So I'll just <laughs> turn this off. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I love rhyming. Um, I love rhyming in poems and it's, you know, I, when, when I sort of, I love, and I love poems that rhyme too. It's a little psycho, right? I sort of feel like rhyming poems, like, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's a little like the, um, it could be a little like a nursery rhyme. It could feel cracked sometime to do it sometimes, but I, I think, Maybe when I first read Plath, I started to understand a new relationship to rhyme about, you know, what, what half rhymes, slant rhymes, off rhymes do in a poem and how they kind of make it tumble forward. Um, if, you know, I, I, there's a way in which when the mind is sort of reaching for that sound is sort of gra you know gravitating toward that like sound it it's it's pulling the kind of conceptual intellect in that in one direction and then meanwhile over creating a distraction meanwhile over here this other part of the associative mind gets to kind of slip in and, and it's it's it for me when the poem when i get a poem to the state where i am kind of beginning to rhyme occasionally um, it's thrilling and I just want to keep going because I just, I feel like you're in Groundhog Day there, Paisley. He, it's like, <laughs> he sort of keeps going by the background. So, um, <laughs> um, it, um, the rhyming becomes kind of, um, it's like incantatory. It becomes like a sort of spell that you get to make of language. And I really like that. In terms of couplets, I, you know, I've been asked about that quite a bit and, and I keep thinking of a very smart answer for it. Of course, like couplets are, you know, um, the, the like Roman poets used couplets in the elegiac mode. Maybe I'll go with that, but I just like them. I like that they're slim. I like that there's this sort of air and light around them. I like that I can, you know, they allow me to sort of see 
they bring some air into a poem. And, and, um, and I feel that that's sometimes necessary. When I, sometimes when I look at a, like, I, I often write in a block, you know, when the poem comes out that way. Sometimes I look at that in my own, in the own poems and I think, I don't want to go in there. Like that looks, that looks a little dark in there. You know, it's like, it's kind of thick in there and I can't see where I'm going. And so I want to get some air into it. When I do put things into couplets, I tend to see what needs to go as well. I tend to sort of see the lines um, as having more of a proposition, you know, to do with sound. And then I start to pull things out of it to kind of pair it back. So that's, that's maybe, maybe, you know, what it is with, um, um, I found I rhymed a lot more in this book than I have before, and I'm still wanting to do that a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a kind of that kind of crazy poem in there that's sort of like quasi heroic couplets. You know, that I never would have, I know that I would have. Um, I actually wrote that poem, that's in Cuthbert, it's a long poem in heroic couplets. I didn't put it in the book. Uh, this is too, this is like a sad animal poem. Like I'm not, you know, I've had in a whole lifetime of sad animal poems, like I'm going to leave it out, but then I put it in and, and, and I'm glad I did. So. But it's also very funny. And it's, uh, it's, just, this is going to lead to the next question. Cause one of the things you said about Plath and, and some of those rhymes and also with the couplets, there's a lot of the humor I mean, there's there's definitely ways in which those rhyming moments kind of snap everything together emotionally, really really bring that kind of closure. But there's a lot of times, and I was thinking specifically about that Cuthbert poem, where those rhymes start to become funny. And the last question is about that, which is that much has been said about the darkness, the severity, the gothic elements of the poems, but also they seem to be very suffused with pleasure and humor. And um, if this isn't nuttily idiosyncratic, but not my words, hers, um, can you talk about how these elements sit together in your poems? Well, I'm really, I'm really glad to have, you know, a couple of places have, have mentioned that they thought some of the poems were funny. And I'm so relieved because I actually think they're a scream, right? You know, like that's, sometimes I, I think like some of these poems are really funny, but it's hard we're used to poems being very serious, you know, being places where we say serious things about serious topics. But I also wanted to, you know, there were things about it that were funny. And part of, I think, what I was trying to do or even reproduce was the, this kind of, you know, Northern Midwestern kind of humor, which is understated it's a little dark it's very scandinavian you know it's like it's it's it, it but it exists right it's actually there and it's in these sort of low-key things that people say and both of my parents are you know my father's dead my mother is still very much alive and she's hilarious like my mother is like really funny but it's like on a low burn that humor you know and so it's it's I kind of wanted some of that to be in the poem, in the poems, but there was also a bit of absurdity too in some of these things, you know? I mean, there, there's a, a couple appearances by my, my grandfather's hired man and my grandfather kept shrinking because of scoliosis. He developed, a, you know, he had quite a, a, a curvature of the spine and he, by the end of his life, he was well below five feet. He was more like four and a half feet tall and he still was working on this farm and he had, a hired man who was about six foot four and oh, well over 300 pounds and his everyone called him tiny and so the two of them these two men would go everywhere together you know and it was this like giant and a, and this very small man together and you would see them coming and it was comedic to sort of see these two it was it was like a fairy tale or it was like a cartoon and yet these were people I knew and loved, like these were actual, you know, these were my family. And, um, but it doesn't mean they also weren't funny. You know, I mean, it's like, there's a way in which they were, they've become these kind of stories. But I also, you know, um, our, our humor is, is humor and sadness, like live, live together. Like they, 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 they go side by side. And also 
you know, I said this to the students today or I was meeting with, but when you are writing a poem, the last moment at which you have the allegiance of that poem is to you is in the moment of composition. But as soon as it's on paper, as soon as you've written it down, the allegiance of that poem has to go to the reader. You know, it moves away from the self, it moves away from the poet, and it starts to reach outward toward the reader. And so in these poems too, I've always got this, like I want a reader to be entertained, interested, engaged, I know, you know, people like rhyme, they like sound effects, they like funny things, they like sad stories, they like the two of these, you know, but I'm always thinking like, yeah, I want to, you know, I want, I want a reader to be interested. I want a reader to some, maybe be a little, to, to scare them a little, to move them like that's, it, it becomes, my allegiance then becomes about, my job is to shepherd that poem from that point of composition to the reader and I need to get out of the way. So um, I don't know that that's answered the question, but I, I think, um, you know, I want my poems to also, now suddenly I figured out how to write poems that I think are kind of funny. And I want that, and I want to keep doing that. Yeah, I mean, I, the poems that you listed are the ones that I found the funniest too. Ha ha, little hunchback, and the ones about tiny. But then also I do, I find it, 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 is a, it, it is a very Scandinavian pleasure, says Rechtal, about like that Cuthbert poem. <laughs> I love because you just know what's going to happen to little Cuthbert, you know, and having to say the name over and over, little Cuthbert, and, you know, there's something so Anglo-Saxon about the whole, the whole terrible thing that's going to happen. No one, no one named Cuthbert. Nothing, nothing good happens to a sheep, and nothing certainly good happens to a sheep named Cuthbert. So, um, well, any other questions? But um, I mean, as if not, this was just a beautiful reading. It was a wonderful Q&A and we're so delighted to have had you here for a week. We, um, I know you're still working with some of the graduate students. So, but thank you so much. It was just a treat and a pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Paisley. And thanks to everyone there at the University of Utah. This has been, it's been great. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to students again tomorrow and thanks for inviting me. Thank you again so much, Mark, for an engaging and wonderful event. Really enjoyed it. Was even scared a little bit. So I think mission accomplished. Uh, thank you so much to Paisley, Jackie, Maddie, Paula, and Tyler for their help with this event. And to those of you that have tuned in, uh, we hope you enjoyed your evening. We're gonna be holding an event with Janet Sarbanes next Thursday, a week from tonight. And we hope you will register and tune in for that as well. Thanks again, Mark. It's been great to have you. Um, and take care, everyone.